Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 140 of Radio 815, the podcast dedicated to examining the works of writer, director, producer J.J. Abrams and his extended Bad Robot universe. I'm Matt Crandall here with my co host, Marcelo Inestroza, as we continue taking a look at the mini series 112263. Today, we are talking about the third episode entitled Other Voices, Other Rooms. And I just have to know, Marcelo, do you have an English to Russian dictionary lying around? I do not. To, to be honest with you, I really thought the first half of this episode was really, really fucking boring. Like, like it was it was it was not what I was expecting I, from, you know, you know, if you if you guys really listen to the last episode, which me and Matt weren't too happy with, I really thought Jake was going to take the bull by the horns and really uh, move forward and try and really figure out a way to save JFK or or to or to progress his journey to the past forward. And this this episode really felt like a stop in the road for me that I didn't know if it was really necessary. I mean, what did you think? I had mentioned as we started this that I thought I had watched this mini series and I own it on Blu-ray. And then I realized I had never actually gotten around to watching it. And I don't know if I would have finished watching it after this episode if we weren't doing it for the podcast, because I started to get a little bit frustrated that this feels like it might have been better served as a movie. And it's only because of some of the, the tangents and things we're doing. Now, obviously, it's early in the game, so they still have time to make me care about these characters. But I'm not quite there yet, because obviously Jake is the lead, so I've got to kind of be a little bit interested in him. And we add Bill into the mix in a big way in this episode, after having him show up at the end of last episode. But I'm still not really invested in this whole plot to save JFK. Which sounds crazy because that should be something that I care about. I, I'm kind of wondering what will all of this be for? Because I'm also thinking about the butterfly effect and other time travel things that I know about. Will, even if they succeed, will this actually do anything to Jake's present that will be noticeable, important? Or will it just cause a chain reaction that might end up making the future worse? So this whole time, it's like all of this stuff is going on. But we don't know what this will actually fix in the future. And I almost wish that there was some sort of catastrophic event at the start that they could trace back to this and think like, if we go back and do this, it will stop X from happening. Because then I would be a little bit more invested rather than just this overall, I think the world would have been better if JFK had lived. That's not that strong a motivation. Especially for a young guy like Jake, he is now, by the time this episode ends, he's been in the past for two years. So I'm, I'm starting to wonder, what is this all for? And I think at episode three, that's not something I should be wondering because enough stuff should be happening that I don't think about that. That said, in the early going of this episode, I really did like where they take the tour of the grassy knoll and all these important things as Jake is telling Bill, like, this is the shit that goes down and this is why. And here's the book depository so they can try and figure out their plans. You know, moving to your point, I really I really thought I, I really thought that it would have been beneficial for Jake to take Bill uh, to take Bill to the future to prove to him that he was an actual time traveler. And maybe they could have done something in the future and then when they came back to the 60s, it would have been different, right? Because I think that Bill, as a character, really had to take uh, uh, Jake on his word. And I, and I look, 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 Bill as a character isn't really that smart. But I thought I, I, I think um, I think it would have been really cool for Jake to actually take Bill to the future and then bring him back to the past. So that way, to move to your point, we could actually see if if going to the future and then going back to the past uh, uh, had actu had any actual uh, physical change on you know you know uh, in the sixties. But then again, we're we're reminded of the rules of this universe that if you go back to the door, it's like it's like everything you just did is sort of erased. So it's like you you have to stay on this path, right? So in that regard, the the way that the time 
the, the way that the time travel is done in this narrative, it's good, but then it's not good, if, if, if that makes any sense. Well, it's not good because ask yourself, would you give up your entire life and travel back in time to save JFK and then you had to live in the 60s forever and not come back to your current time? So if if Jake coming back would undo everything, he has to stay there. So are you willing to say goodbye to everyone you've ever met? Say goodbye to your iPhone. Say goodbye to Netflix to come back in time and save a dude that you didn't know to maybe create a better future that you will never actually get to see in the same way because you're going to live through a different time displaced by 40 years. I just, I find that a big ask. Right. Right. That's the question. I think, I, I think, I think one of the primary questions of this episode is would you, and, and, and would you do this completely on faith, not knowing that, what you're doing will actually make a difference. And I think that's the big ask of this episode. But Jake has been, Jake was set up as a character to not have like, 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 like the only thing we know about him is that he was, he, he was a, he was a teacher at a school and his wife left him, but the writers really don't give him much else to keep him uh, in, in our present day per, uh, uh, per se, which is uh, uh, 2016. Uh, at the time that at the time that this was released, right. but let me ask you something: Did you think it was a good idea for Jake to Jake and Bill to go to Texas to arrive in Texas almost two years before uh, Oswald arrived there and bug his house and hope to get any information on whether or not he was the actual, whether or not he was a killer that will eventually be roped into this whole JFK conspiracy? I think that's an interesting angle because it gives us something to work towards. But we also do a giant time jump where like we see them arrive there and we see, you know, Jake get a job at a school. And I thought that was interesting that like he's getting a job. He's settling into like a real life rather than just being some time traveling drifter. He's trying to set up a, a semblance of a life so that they can make this happen. And then we kind of, flash forward to they've been there for two years getting stuff ready and they're waiting for this big moment where Oswald comes home and isn't greeted as the hero that he thought he would be greeted as and then they they bug his apartment so it seems like the logical steps to take because you know they want to be sure because there's so much mystery around what actually happened you know there are conspiracy theories that Oswald isn't the one who pulled the trigger so they can't just take Oswald off the board right now because that might not actually do anything. There might be other people. It might be the CIA. We don't know. So I do think that adds some intrigue to it. And seeing Jake and Bill try and find their way to verify what they know from history is interesting. So I did think like, you know, okay, we're going to bug his apartment and we're going to get a guy. And we're going to tell him that we're trying to get recordings of our cheating wife. No red flags are risen. And we're going to see that we go to a strip club and the guy who's hanging out there is Jack Ruby, who is the guy who shoots Oswald a few days after the assassination. So, like, we're putting pieces from history on the board and what we know, but there's still, because this real life event, there's so many unknowns. You know, I, since we've been doing this podcast, I rewatched the Nicolas Cage, Sean Connery movie, The Rock, and the big stinger at the end is where Nicolas Cage looks at his girlfriend after he's got this microfilm and he goes, do you want to know who killed JFK? And I think Jake and Bill would sure like to fucking know so they could maybe take that person off the board right now and get this thing done. What do you think of uh, of um, of Jake and Bill's surveillance equipment being uh, being ransacked by... The neighbor of the uh, uh, a neighbor the, of, of the uh, of the apartment complex that they all live in. What, what do you think about that whole thing? Because I thought I thought that whole thing was like, oh, they did all this crap and that didn't mean anything. So I was like, that was a little like I wasn't sure if that was good writing or if that was just to give the characters a problem to deal with. Because I'm like, the whole episode they record who knows how much footage of Oswald talking to his wife and through that footage we discover that Oswald the only thing that all uh, the only thing that Oswald does is complain and he's very very righteous about his uh, about what he's done for this country and he believes that he should 
be owed more for being the fir- for being the first American defector, if I if I'm rem- if I'm remembering correctly. But I really think that when uh, Jake and Bill's recordings get stolen by the neighbor guy who thinks they're gay, is it, it's it's like a step forward, but it's like a step back. It's kind of a hat on a hat because they had all these recordings, but they couldn't understand them because they were in a different language. So like they already needed to find a way to decipher the recordings, which was going to take a long time and was already a problem they had to try and solve. But then they are reminding us of the prejudices of the time, which, you know, (laughs) uh, uh, this guy smashes their equipment and takes it all because he thinks that they are a couple and he disapproves of that lifestyle And it's very frustrating, and it's also weird the way it's framed because we don't see it. We see Jake being like, yeah, we got to get a Russian English dictionary. You know, Bill, hang out and keep recording, and Jake leaves, and then he comes home and Bill's beat up and all the shit's gone, and you're like, this seemed like a pretty important scene that maybe we should have seen. How did this guy get in? How did this guy beat Bill up? And then they go and try and get the stuff back, and of course... The reel-to-reel tapes are trashed, and they hold back because the dude's daughter is under a table. Why is his daughter hanging out under a table? They literally burst in. Like A lot of the staging of these two events, I thought, was kind of terrible um, and just not as dramatic as it could have been. And I'm like, kind of speaks to maybe what a bad person I am. I'm like, waste this motherfucker. I don't care if his daughter is there. Kill this bitch. This homophobic asshole just take him off the board let's get this guy out of the way so we don't have to worry about it waste him which of course is not what they do (laughs) it's not what they do and we kind of leave that 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 could rear its head later as another problem that's going to be persistent and god i hope not and so that that stuff just rubbed me the wrong way and i am a little bit more interested in the storyline where jake at the school You know, when we see him get the job and then we cut forward the two years, he's settling in and the woman that he met in episode one works at the school, Sadie Dunhill. He he blows their first kind of date at the school thing because he just disappears. And um, I'm like a little bit interested in like what's going on here. Is this going to provide him the motivation to try and stay in the past because he's going to have found like this great love or is it going to be heartache that's then going to maybe make him want to leave the past and just say fuck it for this whole thing so how do you feel about this relationship that they introduce as they're doing all of this recording homophobia stuff on the side i was so excited to see the reintroduction of say in this episode because i really think that this is going to give jake like matt just said it's going to give jake a reason to want to accomplish his mission or it's going to give him a a fork in the road to not accomplish to not to not uh, accomplish his mission. So I'm really excited to see how this is going to play out. And uh, I really really like the uh, the way that the actress plays off of John uh, James Franco. I think they have a great chemistry, and I'm excited to see where it goes and ultimately if this mission will be successful or if it will blow up in Jake's face because at this point at this point I would rather see him stay in the past and not uh and not save JFK I would rather see him stay with Sadie than uh, achieve his mission because because like we said earlier in this episode like for Jake to try and do that he won't see uh the successes of his labor if he if he stays there and if he goes back to present day uh, from what we know with his friend, he might die of cancer because if you stay in the past too long, when you go into when, when you, when you go through the rabbit hole again, he might be diagnosed with cancer. So it's really strange to me. And it's really sort of distressing that I'm more interested for Jake to stay in the past with Sadie than see him accomplish his mission, which is what the, which is what the whole, damn show is uh framed around right yeah it absolutely is you know after she's mad at him because he blew her off at the dance to go do the bugging that almost goes awry because they thought oswald was going to be away and he shows up and they have a close call where they almost get caught and then he apologizes and it doesn't seem like the apology is working but then they do have a, a moment where they share a kiss 
And so it seems like, okay, I guess his apology worked. Although watching it now and knowing that James Franco in real life is kind of a bit of a creep, I'm like, oh, girl, you're making a huge mistake. What are you doing here? The episode culminates with Jake and Bill after the recording stuff has gone so wrong. After he's kind of getting his personal life on track, they track Oswald to a rally. And this is where basically General Walker comes out and Oswald has a freak out in the street that Jake and Bill witness where he is screaming and freaking out that this guy's a fascist and that something needs to change. And the look that we get kind of from Jake and Bill is kind of like, OK, this guy seems like someone who would assassinate the president of the United States because he really loses it. What are you thinking as this em- episode has that moment with Oswald where he snaps in the street and has to be restrained. I think I think it's a fantastic moment because I, I really, really love how the actor who plays Oswald in this miniseries committed to it. I mean, he's, like I said earlier, the way that the character is played by the actor who plays him, I don't know his name, you'll have to forgive me. It, it is so, he is so, un, he is so unkept and so unwound. And he seems like a person that, it, that wants to blame other people for his misfortunes. And also he seems like the person, I mean, you know, you know, me and Matt have been talking about conspiracies a little bit in this episode. He seems like the type of person that would be a perfect fit to be set up as a patsy because he seems like a person uh, convinced or manipulated to do a certain thing because of his prior experiences and because of his prior belief in things. So after I watched this episode, I got convinced that it wasn't Oswald, that he was an actual patsy. What, what happened in reality? And somebody else killed JFK or something else happened. I do think that there's got to be some sort of wild card event that's going to happen as I'm assuming this will ramp up to the fateful day that the title implies. And I think it's not going to be as easy as them being right that Oswald is the guy and that every safeguard they take is going to work because that would would feel a little bit like a let a letdown if it's just that but also i don't know if they're going to be willing to float some sort of crazy conspiracy theory that they're going to hinge the whole thing on because you know this is a sensitive subject because they are working with real events so i don't know how many liberties they are going to be willing to take as we go forward but i'm interested to find out um and i do think that the guy who played oswald who um is an actor named daniel weber is convincing and it it was interesting when he had that freak out and you're like oh man it, this guy definitely seems like he could could do this but we have a lot of seeds of doubt and a long way to go knowing that this thing is eight episodes and we're only three deep so there's still five hours of twists and turns romance to go wrong and other things to go wrong um what are you hoping we see coming up next week i know you have seen this but what what are you really hoping jake and bill get up to i am really hoping that jake and bill sort of get stuck in the muck and they really get some hard evidence they 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 really start to formulate a plan of how they're going to deal with the faithful day because i because i am con- I, because i am of the constant belief that Jake is going to get involved with Sadie and Sadie is going to disrupt his ultimate goal. And he, and, and, and his love of Sadie is, or is, is going to overtake them. The, uh, is going to overtake the main narrative of the show. So I really hope that Sadie is, is there, but she doesn't sort of distract from the main narrative because as much as I love the Jake and Sadie relationship, that shouldn't be my primary focus in this show. And after this episode, I really think it is. You know, on that same note, what are you hoping for, you know, uh, in the episodes to come? I'm hoping that we find a way to make me care more about this central plot. Jake finds a way for me to care more about him because of what he does rather than just because he is A-list movie star James Franco at the time. Because I feel like they are cruising on that a little bit. You know what? As you were just saying that, I, I I would really look, I know this is based on a Stephen King book. And from what I've heard from my friends who love Stephen King, this is one of the best books that he's written to them. But on that same remark, I would really love some bad robot shit. Like, like I would really like Jake to go back to the past. And 
I, I, I would really love some bad robot shit. And, and you know, and for uh, for those of you who have been listening to us from the very beginning, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to sit here and uh, and break it down for you step by step, but I would really love some Tommy Wimey bullshit that I don't think is going to happen because it's based on a Stephen King book. And Stephen King takes really interesting concepts, but sometimes he doesn't deliver in a satisfying way to me. And I think the adaptation is going to honor his vision of the original work rather than rather than twist it and fuck it up in a bad robot kind of way. If Jake doesn't watch a fucked up instructional video in the next two episodes, I'm going to be really disappointed. <laughs> um, that's the kind of bad robot shit I'm hoping we get. He stumbles upon a secret bunker and there's a bunch of TV monitors showing him Chris Cooper in the future serving coffee or something like I, I need something like that. Although I will say that I do like that, you know, occasionally people pop up who I have a relationship with from other shows. And uh, in this episode, Nick Searcy from justified art Mullen Raylan Givens boss showed up as a dude named Deke Simmons. Um, so I, I always appreciate when we get a good character actor or somebody that I like from another show just to pop in. And I'm sure that we're going to get a few more pop ins from familiar faces as this goes along. So that is episode three of 11, 22, 63. Next week, we will be talking about the fourth episode, which is entitled the eyes of Texas. So we will have to see what Jake and his whole gang get up to. And if there is any time travel shenanigans that we can make this a little bit more dynamic. So that is the homework. If you are watching along, if you want to get in touch with us, we are happy to get any comments or feedback, and we will read them on the show on X using the hashtag Radio815 or at JJUniverse815. We appreciate everybody who listens. Please like, share, follow, subscribe on any podcast platform or on our YouTube, youtube.com slash Radio815, where the back episodes are also available there in audio video form. If you want to get in touch with me, I am available on Blue Sky. Uh, Cinematic Crandall is my name on there because fuck Elon. Uh, Marcelo, how can people get in touch with you? Um, well, you guys can get in touch with me on, you know, Elon's platform, Elon's platform, X. Um, I'm at Creek Fanatic 88. All right. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, Radio 815 over and out. Radio 815 is a Balloonhead Productions presentation in association with Killer Newt Productions.